It's uh, six thirty. We have a quorum. Um, one is one person is missing. I'm sure he will show up. I think later. And I, uh, we'll I have a uh, text from Mark. He's on his way. Okay. So uh, we'll open the meeting. And first up, Mr. Dwyer is who? I have Mike Gagnon, who I believe is working with Kurt. Okay. Good evening, everybody. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? Yes, fine. Hey. So, yeah, so what I'd like to do uh, on behalf of Kurt um, and his group is just provide you with uh, essentially of an overview um, of the development of the, or what we're calling the renovation of 401 Russell Street. Um, may I share my screen? Just a sec. Okay, go ahead. <coughs> Okay, can everybody see that? Yes. Okay, so this is a rendering um, that essentially we put together showing uh, what we believe would be um, a good plan um, as, as you had heard uh, Kurt talk about. And essentially what this concept shows is a three-story uh, office building uh, essentially located pretty much in the footprint of the existing Howard Johnson's uh, restaurant. I'm going to zoom in a little bit here. And what we did is we actually superimposed the graphics um, over the ortho plan. So it kind of gives it some definition uh, with respect to um, some of the underlying features and, and existing uh, detail that is out there. So just to give you a little orientation, uh, Russell Street um, is over here to the left. Um, the two existing entrances to the Howard Johnson's facility, there's a, there's a curb cut right in here um, that's going to actually be closed off with this project. This is going to be all green space um, in the front, and we're essentially going to retain the existing egress uh, that's located up in, in this area here. Uh, the existing uh, Staples uh, retail facility is, is actually off the page um, at the upper uh, portion here. Um, and this is the existing right-of-way access that goes out to Westgate Center Drive. Um, and that also is going to be maintained um, as sure. part of this project. And lastly, uh, Midas, uh, the repair facility is, is located down here. So Obviously, one of the challenges um, that we have with this project is across the back here, we've got a considerable uh, wetland resource area um, uh, that uh, will have to be reviewed as part of a notice of intent filing um, that, uh, that we'll file with your Conservation Commission for the activities uh, within the 100-foot buffer. Um, but just to kind of talk about some of the specifics here. So essentially the existing Howard Johnson's building is gonna be removed um, in its entirety and will be replaced uh, with this new three-story structure. Um, the main entrance to the building uh, essentially will be in the rear here um, with uh, some accessible parking spaces um, across the back here. Um, we've laid out the parking area based upon um, providing access for a typical fire department vehicle so they would be able to um, essentially get through the site uh, in here. Uh, the site generally slopes um, from north to south. Uh, so essentially we'll be maintaining the existing topography and uh, stormwater management uh, is going to be addressed through a stormwater management basin that will be constructed um, back along the edge of the, the parking area. And with this particular project, we were actually able to achieve a 12%, roughly 12% um, with this plan reduction in, in impervious cover. So, you know, essentially out of the box, uh, we have a pretty significant reduction um, in peak flows from stormwater runoff. So, 
one of the objectives here with stormwater management is to provide stormwater uh, quality enhancement. And, you know, we need to do that uh, to comply with uh, DEP's um, stormwater management standards. Um, Part of the studies uh, that we're undertaking uh, with this project is uh, we, we are um, in the midst of preparing a traffic uh, uh, impact study, um, recognizing the proposed use is going from off is uh, is going from an existing hotel uh, to proposed office. So essentially, we're looking at um, the intersections on the public roadways um, that are adjacent to the site, uh, most notably the existing access drives into the site, uh, the signalized uh, intersection um, that's that's up off the page here at Westgate Center Drive. So we're analyzing that to ensure um, that there's gonna be no uh, dramatic uh, impacts uh, as a result of traffic generation. And I think the good news is, um, at least on a preliminary basis, is there's no indicators um, that, that we're gonna significantly alter uh, the level of service, uh, particularly along Route 9, um, as well as Westgate Center Drive. So I think, you know, that that's, kind of a brief overview of the project. I mean, obviously we'll be coming for, uh, before you with a formal uh, site plan um, submission and filing. Um, and as I had mentioned previously, uh, um, we're also gonna be filing with your conservation commission um, for a notice of intent. So, you know, I think with that, I'd be happy and or Kurt would, uh, would be happy to entertain any uh, questions that you may have. I just got, you know, basically two, what, what is your guest of a best guess of a timeline? So well, I am. Yeah, I go I, ahead. Kurt. I think, I think there's a lot of stars that have to line up, Jim. I don't, um, this is not a hundred percent go at this point. Okay. You know, we're not we're not going to be doing anything unless we have a tenant, um, and there's there's some stars that need to line up there. If if it all goes well, it's next year. Let's put it that way. Okay. Um, what what is your best guess of what the building will look like? You know, um, I actually we we have a we have a, I think it's Kuhn Riddle doing uh, some elevations for us and and. Frankly, we haven't got to that point yet. Okay. I think we'll have, you know, that'll come down. I, you know, my guess, best guess, it'll, it, it'll be this, something that may look like what you've seen over at would Drive over there. But, you know, I don't know, to be honest with you. Okay. Fair enough. Anybody else have anything? Well, this is probably a question to the engineer. Is there going to be any potential leaching catch basin underneath the parking lot as many people are doing now yeah so one of the uh one of the challenges joe uh, with this particular site is um we've got a high groundwater uh, conditions out here the groundwater is estimated about two two and a half feet below the surface um so in terms of providing any subsurface uh, stormwater bmps I think that's gonna be a challenge uh, in order to be able to get the two foot required minimum separation distance that uh, DEP typically requires uh, from recharge uh, BMPs. So what, what, we're going, what we're hoping here is essentially to have everything run off towards the, uh, towards the basin down at the lower end of the parking lot. Uh, one of the considerations with respect to that, and, and it will require some some investigations, is you know um, we had thought about we do this on a lot of our projects is you know is roof water. Roof water is you know typically pretty clean, um, so that's you know that that's a good candidate uh, to put into the ground uh, because it doesn't require a significant amount of treatment. Um, but again, on on sites like this, it 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 can be a, a challenge just with the high groundwater conditions. Okay. Anybody else have anything? If not, okay, well, good luck and we'll be waiting to hear back from you. 
Thank you all. Good to see you. We'll Thanks. see you. We'll see you when we see you. Yeah. Stay healthy. Yeah, you all do well. See Thank you, you so much for your time, guys. Mr. Dwyer, next. We next have uh, Mr. Grimaldi. Popeyes, I believe. Okay. Hello, all. Uh, just give me two minutes. I was trying to get off the road on that. So give me two seconds. Um, what we are, while I'm pulling over, uh, what we are coming back to you today is we have our building approved and uh, we are, uh, you know, as most of you guys noticed from this morning, um, we're in for permit and we just got to dot a few I's and cross a few T's and we'll hopefully be under construction shortly. Oh, just um, by way of background, I'm the only member of the development team from the planning board. Oh, okay. So if you want to bring everyone else up to speed on where you are in the process, feel okay, free. Okay, so from the building standpoint, and I apologize because uh, I'm doing this remotely. I'm doing this all from my iPhone. So um, I apologize for technical difficulties. Um, we are... Uh, we're in from, uh, you know, you, the board graciously granted us uh, an approval on the building so we could file. Uh, everything's been filed for a while. We have a couple of details to work out with the uh, plumbing official right now, just as far as the amount of uh, uh, fixture units going through the grease trap. But um, I'm sure um, Dennis Phil will be able to work. We'll be able to work it out with Mr. Phil and um the only other thing is really just a, a meeting with the uh, fire department and our contractor once we have a contractor signed on and we'll get that project underway, which will be a good fall project for somebody as it gets cold because there's, you know, it's an internal job mainly. Um, but we finally got the, uh, the franchisees uh, approved sign vendor to come back with the halo lit um, signage. Uh, that we submitted into the town. And now, again, this is where we're going to have some trickiness here. I'm going to try to share. Well, if, if it's easier, I I can share. I have the I have it up, and I've already distributed it to everyone else as well. If you could, that would be fantastic. I greatly appreciate it. Okay, so let's see. There is the Popeye's package. Okay. So we are now on page one. Okay, so page one is the um, sign that will uh, uh, face South Maple. And it is the you know one sign, just Popeyes, no Louisiana kitchen, um, that will be facing South Maple. And it is halo lit with LEDs that will be out from back and behind. And the square footage is the 32.25 square feet. Okay, so page one is a side view. So I'm gonna go on to page two. Well, no, two. no, 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 this is the front and side oh, view. Oh, that is the front, okay. So the front and side. So it's the what you're gonna be seeing in the front. And then, so those letters are you know, opaque and the lighting is going to bleed out from the perimeter of each of those sign letters. That looks fine. I'm if I'm looking at the drawing right, I don't see any standoffs. It looks flush mounted to the wall, so I don't see how it can be halo lit if there's no gap between uh, behind it. You know, as I'm looking at it, I'm 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 there with you, because the returns look full look full back. Now, just hang on one second here. You know what? I I'm telling you this. Well, let me say it from the square footage standpoint. This is correct. From the halo correction, this is. I didn't send you the correct one. So let me uh, first see if I could get it on. Let me ask you this, if we should bother continuing or not. This will be the, the correct square footage with the halo lit. It'll have the gap and it'll have the halo lit edge. Okay. Um, if we could speak about the square footage and then give me a second, I will try to see if I have the corrected one. Um, but 
So the front, the front is a total square footage of 32.25 square feet. That's right. And the only other signage we have on the building are the two medallions on the both sides of the uh, face of the building. Um, and they are 7.07 .07 square feet. So generally speaking, we have a total square footage for the entire building of 47 square feet. And I believe, if I remember correctly, from the last, um, from the last um, planning board meeting, the we were ha we had a limit of sixty four. That is correct. So that said, and let me just make sure I'm trying to get. Um, and I apologize. I sent you this again this afternoon while I was again in the, on the road and I did get a set of incorrect ones that did not have it. And of course that's the one I sent you because I was in a rush. Um, but they hundred and I'll testify to that matter. They will a hundred percent be uh, the halo lit, which basically all that happens is that that side return is not a full return. And there is a, another aluminum structure that holds the uh, letters off and the full return doesn't go all the way back. It's approximately about three quarters of an inch of a hold off with a little reflective piece on the edge of that so that when the halo light comes in, it makes the nice surround. Um, so they will be a halo lit and the overall square footage will be less than 47 feet, 47 square feet. Oh, we were sent, uh, maybe I lost you. What was the 32 feet? 32 feet is the sign that faces South Maple, 32.25. And then you get 15 square feet on the other one? Well, 7.07 .07 square feet on each side. So a total of 14.14 14 14 square feet on both sides. 47. So 40, 46 and change, 47. Was there some directional signs uh, like for the drive-ins to included in that package? Um, this is just purely the building signage. And there is, uh, as, as you guys may or may not remember, there is actually a pylon sign that at the moment he's not even going to consider because right now it, th their view is, well, look where it's sitting. I don't know if we need it. Um, because we're facing, yeah, you know, we're dead facing uh, South Maple. And so when you come up from that side, as long as we have the medallions on there, um, you're going to, you're going to see the building. So the, right now there is the ingress and egress to the back service road there. And there is a pylon sign there at the moment. Um, at the moment, he's going to, they're going to come in. Uh, our understanding is if we, even if we try to reactivate that pylon, it's going to have to go through this, a standard procedure as if it was a new pylon, correct? Yes. So he's like, you know what? We're not saving anything right now. He, and basically he's like, we're not, sorry, we're not losing anything right now. So let's go in and see if we could save a couple of dollars. I don't think we're going to need the, the pylon sign to be seen. So they're, not looking to activate the pylon sign. And uh, basically I believe the, we're not changing the direction of the um, flow of the drive-through as it is right now. You'll, you'll have obviously have the arrows painted on the, on the ground. Um, but I, I don't believe there's any planned illuminated signage, directional signage internally onto the site. Great. On, are, are the medallion signs halo lit or just plain? No, they they will also be halo lit also. Okay. Let me get that up again. Uh, and remember, our, our building is basically at the top white. Oh, okay. A little twitchy here, sorry. No, no, believe me again, I, I'm sorry for not, for being so unprofessional in the fashion that I'm acting right now, but so let Schedule. me just scroll scroll through it just so we can be sure we've seen everything. Uh, so this page. is 
Page two. This is the front face and the side profile of it. And the only difference is that three inch dimension that you have there. And when I get you the corrected ones, and obviously if I don't find it now, I'll have it over to you tomorrow. Um, the three inch dimension that you have, you see there for the full return, that three inch dimension will be lessened so that I believe it's a three quarters of an inch hold off. And then internally there's a structure that has a little reflective piece and a little aluminum piece, obviously, to hold the return back so that the light bleeds out from around the signage. Okay, so I'm going to so, move on to page three. Those are the medallions you're talking about. Those are 100% the medallions and the same thing. So that three-inch return then in turn gets um, not the, – the edge of that gets cut out, and we have a halo around that. Okay. So let me now go to page four. Which now that places the sign that was the first sign that you saw, it places it in the location on the building, on the front face facing South Maple. Okay. I was going to ask you, as I was going to ask you what is considered the front face? So it is the one facing South Maple. That, okay. this, this is what I'm considering the front face, the <laughs> face that faces South Maple. That's fine. So th there's been some minor confusion with the address on this because it is part of the same larger parcel that includes L.L. Bean, the 109 or whatever grill, um, the optical shop that's no longer there, uh, the AT&T, that whole corner with frontage on, on Russell and Russell. South Maple is one parcel and it had been carrying a Russell Street street address. Um, so I guess this has been now changed on the E911 books to, for a South Maple Street address. After our planning board last time, uh, I believe, and I, I apologize if I'm incorrect, but I believe DD had concurred with the 911 uh, control system and let them tell her what we should be. And in turn, that's where we became three South Maple Street Road. Okay, so let me just pop out along to uh, page five, which is showing where the medallions are going to go. Yep. And that, so now when you're coming, you know, if you were on Russell and made a right down South Maple, you would come down and you would see our right side elevation. And that would be the medallion. And in turn, that's why the franchisee at the moment is saying, if I got my medallion and I got my sign in the front, why do I even need my, my um, pylon? And if I'm going to have to approach it as if it's a new pylon to begin with, you know, so let's see what we have to do and maybe we don't do it. If we feel we need it, we'll go file it later and spend the money. Mm -hmm. Okay, now I'm going to go on to page six, which are uh, just some now, more detail. The, now, if you go back to actually from this, now go back to the last page, though. So that is, see, uh, at the drive through window, um, just so that we have coverage so that when you're reaching out to get your order, you're not getting soaked with snow or rain. Oh, it's a canopy. That, okay. That would be the canopy that now if you continue to the next page, that is the canopy, which it's, it's basically a flat stock aluminum canopy with two... Um, I believe they're eight by eight uh, LED down lights that just, you know, illuminate. They're, they don't have a large uh, spread or throw, uh, just illuminate um, where you're at so you can see your, uh, your proceed, your change of uh, your order. Okay. And I believe if you go to the next page, and that would just be the canopy over the windows at the front. And that has down lights as well? Yes. And that basically just, we're getting a little throw of uh, light to wash off on the uh, sidewalk. Yeah, and that's only like eight or nine feet above grade, I think. Uh, yes, absolutely. Yep. So that's not gonna spread. Okay. No, you're looking at nine four. Okay. So that the cars don't, the trucks don't run into us. Okay, and then page eight seems to be the same. 
Did, did you even change? Uh, yeah, I did. I went from page seven to page eight. Yeah, so then oh. that's, yeah, just a two, two different window elevations. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Page, page nine should be the um, shutters, yeah. Yes, yeah. yep. And those are just flat attached to the building. And you could go back to, I think it was page five or six that show them the, where they are onto the building. Right. Now the good thing about, yeah, there you go. Um, the good thing about all this, it's all pre-finished, all pre-done. Um, so it's not a maintenance issue. The stuff lasts pretty much forever. So. Okay, so do you think we're going to be here for a little while longer? So, do you think you will be able to find the um, the current plans? Yes, actually, if you uh, want to move on, and I'll just dig into my email and then uh, send them off to you. Okay. Okay. Um, if there's anything else, do you need from me? No, nope. get get that get the email to Mr. Dwyer, and uh, we'll approve it tonight. Okay, let me. Uh, I'm going to put myself back on mute. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Dwyer, I'm going to send that to the planning at, right? Correct. Okay, thank you. I have that running in the background. Okay. Great. You got it. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Ken Comia. Oh, hang on a sec. Uh, Didi, did you have something? Do you have questions? Well, yeah, just on the address, um, we did look it up, and I know the bank was, I believe, five South Maple, even though the uh, you know back of it, just like um, Orange Theory, and then they're all to the, you're, they're not facing the road, but they are South Maple addresses too, and because it does face South Maple, um, I believe we double checked in it, and I believe at one time it still had a south maple address and so we made sure with fire and uh, police that it was on south maple okay so that's what they're going with with the address for now okay thank you and you're welcome dd is five south maple uh yes i believe i, no, I, I think we're three yeah there are three yes we're three yeah i just have to double check in here and there were three <laughs> there you go yes yep there yeah there are three i believe orange theory is uh seven and the bank was five okay. that's fine thank you you're welcome mr comia Welcome. Oh, before we get into it, uh, just to cover the technicality, um, Mr. Like, as everybody was sent an email, Mr. Michelson is going to be as verbally requested an extension. He'll be getting me the actual paper copy shortly, but he's requested an extension to 12 7 for his accessory apartment. I'll make a motion to extend to 12 7. With condolences to the loss of his father. You have a motion, Mr. Mike. Second. Seconded. Second. Any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Okay. Sorry, Ken. Before I forget this, I just want to do that. <laughs> um, so, um, good evening, board. So, since the last meeting, which was what two weeks ago, we talked about. Um, trying to quantify or trying to create a, a ballpark number for the calculation of a purchase price based on a qualified market sale. And so um, as I sent the board last night, um, let me share my screen. Um, this document, um, which is the one we've been working on for the past couple of months, um, I know that we had discussed arm's length sale. And so I tried to find, you know, that seems to be an, an actual legal term that I've noticed. And Bill, I don't know if you've come across a different term for that, 
but I also don't know if it's appropriate because it makes this so much longer, um, what I proposed here with regards to using that language. Um, putting the definition of what an arm's length sale is and then you know, using, utilizing the rest of that particular clause. So I think we can still, you know, dwell on that with regards to, um, you know, how you want that to read, just so that if the board is going to be looking at um, those, those um, the, the thing that, that Bill sent this morning, which were the sales prices from the assessor's office, um, that you can determine those based on, um, you know, what's presented and based on what's in this particular regulation. Ken, yeah. uh, just in case we have any public viewing this tonight or in the future, sure. um, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, when we discuss arm's length, that is just to take out of the equation any of those inner family transfers for a dollar which would skew the whole average, right? Yeah, that was my understanding too. And, you know, in the research of what, just searching what arm's length sale is, because I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not familiar with some of those terms. Um, that's what it suggested. And the, the definition was one that I defined here um, in blue that I'm um, highlighting. What, what, um, does, what does that mean, Ken? I don't, where the buyers and sellers independently act without one party influencing the other. My understanding was that um, the influence could be suggested that it's a family or, you know, within a certain, um, yeah. I, I mean, I don't know necessarily the terms, and that's probably but, not the best. But what if, what if the family members got three? independent appraisals is that not arm's length well be, be, without getting into questions yet mike what does the highlighted in blue mean can you explain yeah. that mr dwyer well so it's one of those terms that um um that uh it almost doesn't get defined anywhere because it's so broadly understood um, okay. Could you? So, could you? So, it, for example, I broadly mean. I have here the Uniform uh, Probate Code. One of the powers of a personal representative: sell, lease, or encumber to an arm's length third party any real estate of the estate. So I, I check the definitions of arm's length, and they don't bother to define it. So basically, arm's length implies, or arm's length means a. Um, a situation, you know, as Ken has tried to say here, where neither party has any advantage over the other. Okay. It is um, a willing buyer and a willing seller. Um, I can read off of Google. It says in, in real estate, an arm's length transaction refers to situations in which there is a transfer of property and the buyer and seller act independently of one another. This kind of transaction ensures that both parties act in their self-interest to get the best deal and that neither party exerts pressure over the other. Okay, that, that, that's, I, I wasn't sure what it mean by act independently. Yeah. I mean, I would think with, with, without one influencing the other, I mean, I, okay, so if it's as low as if the relative is a different story, I can see that one then. Yeah. All right, okay, thank you. So, yeah, we can still dwell on the term arm's length sale. I know that in the initial version that I shared with you, and that's why it's still highlighted in red, qualified wasn't quite defined. However, I think maybe that could be further defined within this particular clause, if that's something you want to do, rather than add this arm's length sale, which can add and muddy, maybe not necessarily muddy, but will add just to the the language of this particular um, clause. But um, I think we can still figure that one out. Um, or if you know you take what I've suggested here, um, just replacing literally this this first sentence um, with this language. 
I don't think you even need to define arm's length. Okay. As long as we understand what it is, we're the ones who are um, applying it. Um, so, and that's just in how we get to, and, and this is something I did discuss with Dan Zadonik when I asked him to put together that spreadsheet that we want to, uh, sorry, sorry, take out the highs and the lows. We want to, mm -hmm take out the family deals and we want to take out the McMansions. So I don't know exactly what he picked as his criteria. I'd have to talk with him about it, but he said he took out the, the really high priced ones, the McMansions that uh, uh, say uh, Ron Bercume is building. There's nothing, nothing on this. This sort of tops out in the high fives. And um, I know that property values properties are selling in the sevens uh, in uh, in some subdivisions. So uh, that for a three bedroom or? Well, he does have a category for bedrooms. Uh, I'm going to say the ones that are selling for the sevens are probably uh, five bedroom with um, the flexibility to make two of the bedrooms into offices or home gyms if you want. Um, but um, what what we got from the assessors is basically the uh, the the middle of the road. Yeah, I, and I think too what you know because um, what that will allow you to do is put the require then that the assessor make those um, basically prepare something similar every year because this regulation will need to be amended in some form every year due to the changes in the um, HUD requirements as we're basing some of these numbers on. So if you were to utilize, um, let's say these mean and median numbers um, and then figure out which one you want to use and require, put all of the Basically, for that first for for this first clause, that the assessor's data will be the one to determine that number, and that will be universal. Um, and you use that for every, um, you know, payment in lieu of when you're utilizing this particular calculation um, in a given year. Um, so, you know, I think it's it's helpful that the assessor can provide that document to the board. Um, based on what we're trying to qualify here um, so that there's no further collection uh, or data analysis that the board needs to do. It literally can just, you know, quantify based on the numbers that are provided in the regulation from HUD, as well as the regulation from the, uh, the, the, the number from the assessor's office. Yeah, what's, um, what's our catchment area for? Is it uh, Greater Springfield? Is it just uh, it's the Springfield Africa? MSA? So yes, it's Greater Springfield. So all of Hamden and Hampshire County are in this Springfield MSA. So how, so that would put us in a higher category compared to let's say Springfield uh, one housing unit. What do you mean a higher category? Well, the fact that our prices are going to be more expensive for housing, for houses. Yeah, I mean that it, the number the the number two B would be the same in Springfield that it is in Hadley. The number two A is based on your town's assess um, your town's most recent sales. Um, so yeah, you're probably right in that Springfield will be very different than Hadley's. Um, but the 2B will be based on a number that's universal for every community in Hamden and Hampshire County because they all rely on that. Number. I got you. You have it. You have it so noted. Thank you. Um, and so in addition to what we talked about at the last meeting, we were talking about this um, ability to be um, flexible and so requiring the applicant, um, and this comes from the Shrewsbury 
uh, document that I shared with you at the last uh, maybe one or two meetings ago. Um, but basically, it suggests that the board is providing this particular table, which will which I'll scroll down to, um, and that the board will update th this annually um, based on the HUD's annual numbers. And then, so if there is evidence to the contrary, basically, if the applicant determines that any of the purchase prices should be reduced, then I think that gives them the leeway of presenting to the board an appropriate amount instead of the one that's calculated based on this particular regulation. Um, Kim, and so I, just, uh, I kind of like the Shrewsbury attitude. You know, when you think of communities, uh, we're kind of a, uh, a suburb of, uh, you know, greater Springfield area. Uh -huh. and Shrewsbury certainly is a kind of like a suburb of Worcester, although it's just across the lake. But nevertheless, uh, it's, it's probably a good example as opposed to the previous ones that you were talking uh, down the Cape. So that's just my two cents. Yeah, I mean, the, the thing that's going to be, you know, when, when, yeah, because, because of these inclusionary, this is going to be included in your subsidized housing inventory, there will need to be an approval, as we mentioned, over time by DHCD to approve these units. Right? I, I think, as you recall, Joe, you were talking about how um, wages for the construction of these um, residence uh, buildings are going to be um, you know, documented and monitored. So there is going to be that review process. And so I think that um, they will have something to say um, with regards to you know, the way that it's initially presented to the state. Um, however, that's I do point. think, yeah. yeah, that's a that's a good point you bring up because I was thinking that a protect, uh, let's say a developer is going to build a unit offsite, and he's going to probably make a house that's pretty worn down up to code, and uh, he will do it with the private wages. But you're telling us now that when he does something like that and it goes into the affordable. Uh, 40, 40 B, uh, it's going to have to be prevailing wages. No, no, not at all. Oh. Well, yeah, not, yeah, not, not in all aspects, but, okay. but yeah. all right. um, but th I think this provides the flexibility that you're asking for. I don't know if it's too wordy, if you think that it can be simplified in any way. Um, this suggests that you know, it should satisfy the affordability requirements if they do come up with a different number, um, but it will be up to the planning board or the whoever is going to be responsible for determining, you know, what goes into the fund, um, you know, and making sure that that's amenable to the, the, the spirit of the, the regulation. So, um, so I had one question. Let me look at my copy of this. Sure. Which I have up in the background. Um, um, okay, I don't. I don't think this is too wordy because I think we want to get this right because it's not going to come up very often. Right. Um, I mean, we only have one subdivision that has even triggered this so far. Uh, so. It, that's like one in three years. Now, admittedly, it was a, a downtime and there is other inventory out there. Um, but what I would like to say is in number four, um, that um, um, Maybe the funds contri uh, funds contributed to the town of Hadley in accordance with these guidelines shall be dis shall be um, administered by the Affordable Housing Trust Fund, and then we don't have to say um, anything about any interest earned uh, and 
uh, expended only with the approval of the select board, that's already embedded in the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. I think we just want to make sure that it goes to the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. I've seen direct language in some of the other samples we've looked at about okay. making I'll take a look. So that that basically all of the the um, that all of the funds that are accrued by the inclusionary payment in lieu of will go straight to the affordable housing trust fund. Correct. So in the other examples, okay. Well, we'll see if. So you, you I guess your um, comment was with regards to that particular line about yeah, that, interest. That was regarding number four. If it just goes to the Affordable Housing Trust Fund, the um, crediting interest earned to the fund and the how it can be expended is already embedded in the Affordable Housing Trust Fund language. So as long as we get that it there, sense. the yeah. rest of it doesn't matter. Okay. Is that the majority of the select board? Is that appropriate? I think if we just say it goes to the affordable housing trust fund period, we don't have to put anything else in. Yeah. I oh, agree. so clearing this all up yes. like that. I mean, simpler the simpler the better. Um, that just acknowledges that the funds that are, are collected due to this will go straight to that affordable housing trust fund. Mm -hmm. So the the task at the last meeting was to determine, you know, what a maximum price could be. Um, and I'll just say that it was a challenge because I was trying to figure out um, how through the examples that I was able to find, how they arrived at those. Um, and so I'm going to just open this particular um, this particular link, which um, gave me, or th that I worked off based on um, get, arriving at these numbers, um, based on utilizing the various um, examples that they provided here. There is jargon in there that is there a footnote that, that defines AMI and uh... So to add the, the jargon. Yeah. I'm I think we, do we talk about, I think we talk about AMI up here. Is it? Okay. Yeah. So. Very immediate income. So if we have the parentheses AMI there, that'd be oh, good. Yeah. Um, Thank you. So with regards to this, this number comes from the Springfield um, MSA for 2021. So this is 80% of the area median income is 67,300 for a family of four. Um, and so we are targeting towards uh, area median income of 70% based on, you know, some of these examples that I was able to find um, here. So if you were to look, so from there, how I came to, I think this number was 57,190, um, you know, and you you basically whittle that down to what an, a monthly housing cost would be, where housing is 30% of uh, um, an, a monthly income. So, which quantified to about $1,430 based on a family of four spending 30% of monthly income towards housing costs, including mortgage. And so, um, you know, no, noting that, I kind of worked backwards from where this example here suggested, you know, these particular costs for taxes, insurance, any sort of HOA or condo fee, um, which I quantified with 350 because I found that on another source, which somewhat, you know, makes sense based on some of these numbers. Um, and came up with a principal and interest. And this is where it, it's a little weird because I can't, I can't figure out what they multiplied by what. However, they were all multiplied by the same number. And so 
I divided this mortgage amount by the principal and came up with 162.41. And that was the same for all three of these. So this is very different. Um, and so that arrived at this particular number, or was it the maximum price? One of those. Um, and I just applied that number to come up with one of the, I think it's this number that it, it came up with, um, and then figured out the down payment to, to figure out the, the estimated mortgage. So what I'm saying is that it's based on this example, but I work backward um, and I don't know not necessarily how to um, quantify if, if that's in fact necessary based on this example and based on this resource. Um, so I, I, you know, I asked the board to, you know, if this makes sense, um, but I think it does based on the way some of these numbers are presenting themselves. Uh, and the suggestion would be that this is what your 2B number is. And then you look at your 2A number when we, when you look at you know, clause 2A and 2B over here to, to these, these numbers, and then come up with the difference between this and the 2A, um, which will put you in the range of hmm, almost like 250? No, 210? Um, anyway. Uh, so that, that, that was um, the calculation of this particular section. That was the, the task. Um, I think as I, I mentioned to Bill when he was asking um, about bringing this forward to, to this particular meeting, I haven't yet talked to anyone from Shrewsbury. That was the, like the, the, the team that I really wanted to get some information from with regards to this particular exercise, but no one has returned my calls. Um, and um, but this is what, you know, what we've arrived at based on the resources that are out there. So, so you're saying, if, if I'm interpreting this correctly, in our statistical area, someone who would otherwise qualify for affordable housing can pay no more that can, can afford to pay no more than $185,000 for a home. That's a suggestion, yeah. Okay, and oh, yeah. Then, based on seventy percent of the area median okay. income. Okay, so and that may be a realistic price in Central Hamden County or maybe a hill town, but um, then we look at what the assessors gave us, and um, that's a pretty big spread. So twos to upper fives. Yeah. Well, even if you just do the uh, the mean or the median, which functionally are, I know there's a distinction, but the numbers are close enough. You're around four hundred. So if it's if you can afford one eighty nine, and we're getting three eighty nine and some change. It's like we're looking at a payment in lieu of something in the order of two hundred thousand dollars. Is that? Yeah, I think that's based on the, this particular calculation. I think if you recall from the Shrewsbury example, um, that is where they arrived at. It was like between one eighty-five and two um, for a single-family home. So, yeah. <laughs> So that does make. So what was the, what was the number? I'm just trying to get it in the minute. So what was the number? 189 was the maximum affordable. 185. 185. Five. Plus or minus, and Hadley average is. Three, uh, 
399 call it oh th the, the the mean is 399 realizing that 2020 the prices are high but even if you go to 2019 the mean is 2368 you're still talking you know $190,000 you're right bill and this is to purchase a house when you know so affordable purchases well when, I we, was, talk, when we talk about I, having 13, I wasn't here last week or two weeks ago but I thought we kind of came to the conclusion that even though we're we're not talking about buying a house, we're talking about affordable rents. That's what I thought we were talking about rentals. Yeah, so I don't even know why we're doing all this stuff. I, we're talking about affordable rents, not buying a house. Well, I mean, I, no, no. on the on the on the screen before you had down payment of eight thousand dollars. Where in the hell are they going to come up with eight thousand well, dollars? Well, like, but I think if we're talking to a if we're talking to a developer of a subdivision. Exactly right. Who Bill. is building houses or selling wow. building lots in there? Right now, um, as Barry did. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think we have to talk about sale prices. Um, yes. Well, what happened to? I guess you know. I probably shouldn't be part of this discussion because you guys clearly went on a different tangent than I thought we were on at the last meeting. I came to was making a contribution per lot and not worrying about all these crazy numbers that but the but the con the contribution per lot has to be based on something exactly yeah and it's got to be based on a sales price of an affordable house well what was i just noticed a number here earlier in in no case less than $60,000 where did that number come from That's a minimum payment. Yeah, but where did it come from? That was just the number we pulled out of the pull out of the air. Thank you. Before all of this research, which yes. shows it's actually quite a bit more. But we're talking about if you've got a development of seven lots, then there'll be a contr contribution per lot, so it could be. Seven times twenty, or, or seven times thirty. No, yep. right. So it's just a lot simpler. This is well. It, it I, this is what what is that? This is. Uh, I understand. I understand what you're saying, Mike, and I don't disagree with you. I, yeah. Okay. I I'll thought we, I'll we wanted to. Put... We wanted to figure out what this worked out to when yeah. we were just talking about. Um, formulas on paper without yeah. any data we didn't know where we were going now we know where we're going and you know frankly i don't think we'll get a, a single payment in lieu at it, it's i can't imagine that it's not going to be more cost effective for a developer to renovate a unit somewhere else in town bearing in mind that it could be a studio apartment Oh. Um, compared to buying out under this formula, but now, but, now but, they, the, but the assumption is they still have to buy that rehab unit, and how are they going to come up with eight thousand dollars for the down payment to get a mortgage, which they probably won't qualify for? Well, so it, it the real but, world. No, that's sort of that's that's not not where we're going with this though okay the, okay the developer has the op the developer has always had two options build an affordable unit in the development yeah or create an affordable unit elsewhere in town or make payment in lieu yeah. so um again bearing in mind only one developer is even implicated in this at this point yeah uh, and we certainly want to try to include include more developers because as we talked the last time i was here the magic number we got is eight and that's what, just what magic mike what magic number is eight 
if you build eight units, you have to have an affordable unit. No, six. Six. I'm sorry, six. Okay. Six. Yeah. So six, six or more triggers affordability. But my question was, why doesn't two or more, if the if the cost of the houses are nine hundred thousand dollars each, why isn't it two or more? Well, that, that's something that Bill, Bill also mentioned that what we should do is go all the way down. That if it's six or more, this is the option. But if it's one to five, there's going to be a minimum contribution per lot. We'll have to amend the zone bylaw because yeah, I agree. Okay. We need to make okay. everybody pay something. Otherwise, we, yeah, exactly. Be... We don't. We don't want these McMansions to escape putting money into the affordable housing trust. Right. Absolutely correct. I think we mentioned that. Yeah. Yeah. Th that'll be something we'll be probably putting on the next okay. uh, town okay. meeting. Okay. Yeah, so this this is just our regulation for the payment in lieu part. Um, but I, I think you're right. I, you mentioned that the last time you were here, that I think you're quite right, that once you start doing subdivisions, now maybe we can leave the ANR lots out of it. But once you start doing subdivisions, um, yeah, it's probably fairer to capture something per lot yeah we so mike this is this is the conversation that we had when i shared those documents from the cape um those two communities on the cape um provincetown and ipswich um required a payment into the housing trust fund um for subdivision development not saying that it was probably very difficult to build subdivisions on the cape but there was a minimum cost to the developer for building any housing. Um, yeah. So that, and and the board at the last meeting suggested that would be something that we talked about at a future yeah. meeting. Well, I think that the cost of building a unit and what it's gonna cost to a lower income person should almost have no bearing at all to what's required to be put into the trust fund because we should just put it, you know, we, we, we pulled it, you pull, pulled the 60 out of the air. We pulled the six out of the air. If we just went back and said per lot, you've got to put so much in two to five lots, put so much per lot. And we don't have to go through all these calculations that on a yearly basis that are just going to be uh, send somebody to the. Well, I don't, think, I don't. Mike, I mean, I, I, I could be corrected. I don't think the 60,000 was meant to be set in stone. I think it was more of a placeholder while we did this, while we ran some, yeah, some yeah. calculations well, to find out what would be a reasonable. Yeah. I, I, I'm just not sure that trying to figure out what the cost of affordable housing is and what you can afford is necessarily correlated to what we want people to put into the trust fund if we want to make it simple and allow the trust fund to grow and clearly given the current state of the bylaw many large developments because they didn't meet the sixth threshold or, or whatever the, the legal structure of the development was have escaped putting money into the trust fund and that has to be remedied Well, and that's that's true, and that but that that is a rewrite of the inclusionary zoning bylaw itself. Okay, that's fine. And I still think that there, I I still like to leave. Well, yeah, maybe in a sense the payment, and if we had a a payment per lot, maybe we didn't need the payment in lieu, but. Um, it's um, because this, the affordable housing number, how much you can afford to pay is a moving number. It's, it's constantly fluctuating. And, uh, but clearly uh, we want to make this simple. And well, uh, the, the, the way to make it simple, Mike, I think is the fact that we almost ought to uh, ignore the fact that we are trying to do some affordable housing and let our threshold go below 10% and have some developer put in 20 units that will satisfy the town's 
for another 15, 20 years. Because when you look at it now, you say, well, we want to charge the uh, somebody, let's say two young school teachers are starting their family. We're penalizing these people because they oh, will fall into That's, the, that's the nature of the beast, unfortunately. You're, this is causing the general cost of housing to go up. And there's no way around that. It, well, if, if there is a way around it by almost ignoring it and say, let's, uh, let's wait for it to go below 10%. True. And then somebody will put some houses up somewhere and uh, we'll have to live with it. It, it well, would be one thing if they put up a few houses, a few apartments. They're not going to put up houses. They're going to put up apartments. There will be apartments, correct. If they, it would be one thing if somebody put up a few apartments. But most of these places that are looking at apartments now are looking to put in 50, 80, 100 units to make them, you know, affordable by scale to construct. So do you really want to put a 100 unit apartment in town that only has? Well, we, we don't we don't know. We could we could qualify. We could limit those if it's still above 10 percent. Not if it falls below 10 percent. Well, is, is there any way that we can go searching for friendly 40B? Say, hey, we, the town wants, you know, I, I, I know we, Dr. Zagrana keeps pointing out the 13%. And, you know, there, there's something uh, attractive to letting it go to 10%. But, but why don't we, what about going the other way? Get it up to 16%. That's if we could get it. That is the idea of the affordable housing trust fund yeah. to entice a developer to come in or developers and do a friendly 40B and we will give you some this much money, extra sure. money to do affordable units so that it qualifies. Yeah. And, and, and the benefit of rental property as i understand it under the current regulations is that you only have to have 25 or 30 percent affordable to, and 100 percent of the apartments in the development qualify for the inventory if only as many as 25 percent are affordable well if we were proactive in this then and, and, and we, could, we, we couldn't be forced to, he could, uh, uh, adverse 40B couldn't come in and put it wherever they wanted to. We could, we could have some control over it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Which I think is important. So I, I, I don't know how to go about suggesting that we want, we're, we're welcome, welcoming friendly 40B offers in town. Well, clearly, you know, clearly public transportation is key to this. I mean, we, Route Nine can't look any more worse than it's trying to look in about well, two years. To do, a, to do a friendly 40B, Mike, a lot of towns or cities have an enticement for them. You know, exempt from taxes, exempt from this, not doing this. We we don't want to make them exempt from taxes. What we're trying to no. do is use the affordable housing trust fund sure. as our enticement, and we need yeah. to get that built up so that we can have a decent enticement for somebody yeah well i think for the first thing you're going to do is get rid of the number six well and, you know clearly it's going to take i really wish we no, could number start six meeting, is, i'll tell you what no, i wish we could start meeting publicly again to look no, at each other six, across the table because this is complicated number, stuff number six right now is an arbitrary number yeah. We can make that something different. I don't want to get rid of number six. I want to make it something that, again, if it's zero to five units, we want them to put something into the fund. Yeah. So we can we can reword number six to make it such that if it's zero to five, it'll be so much per lot or so much per you per lot. Yes. Maybe it's so, twenty thousand per lot or something, and, and then that, you know, that takes it up to a hundred thousand for five lots. You know, so that you know, each lot should sub sub should put something. In. I don't know what the number is. You know, ten thousand a lot. That would be fifty thousand. But right now, it's based on per unit. Be based on the six or more units. Yeah. 
So we're talking two different things here. Yeah. And that's not unlike what Barry Roberts is doing with a, he's taking a slice off of each condo he sells. Sure. And can, and putting that in. So, um, or, or, or let's put it this way, charging more for each condo he sells. Right. <laughs> so, right, Mike. <laughs> so to help, to help Mike out here, maybe uh, Ken, uh, maybe just stop sharing. So we go to fuller, bigger pictures. So, so you get my, you get my argument, you know, I think. No, I, no, I, I do. I, I think they're, 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 all I'm trying to do is if we are going to talk about creating a payment in lieu formula, the other issues are valid, but they go back to the underlying inclusionary zoning bylaw. Um, <clears throat> I think we're just talking about a payment, the payment in lieu slice of that. I think it's worth working out, but I thank you for the work you put in, Ken, working up the numbers for uh, for that for that part, uh, because it really is an eye opener. If, you know, I, I, a payment, sure was payment in but, lieu at that point, and and that's why I think it was worth the exercise, because otherwise we're just going around in circles with what ifs. Now I'm we not, have a hard, hard number, and uh, and it doesn't look pretty. Yeah. No. and I I. Personally, I think we want the payment in lieu for six or more units to be reasonably high as we can talk about this one. We want them, we want to encourage them to build something affordable or convert into something affordable in town. See, it's got to be tied to what the cost of development is, not necessarily six or more units. But the cost of those units. I think we're saying one or the other, up to six, or no, is it one through five? You pay per unit, and then you go to okay. six, okay. and then you have a in lieu of different calculation, which is I want to catch I want to catch the, the 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 McMansions as it's been put. Right. Because and they so slip they slip through the crack, and clearly those are the ones that could afford a decent contribution to the trust. And, our, and we're kind of, you know, damned if we do, damned if we don't. Because if we say we want to keep that per, per lot cost low so that you can build two $300,000 houses and not exorbitantly raise them, then you're letting the McMansions, if they build two 800s off, you're letting them off cheap. So it's, yeah. yeah I, think, I think the days of Hadley building three or four hundred thousand dollar homes is over yeah. well I'm, I'm just tossing out examples yeah i know but i just you, you get my gist it's just it's and then there's the obvious question of what we were talking about earlier is you know i think someone said we want to we want to incentivize people to to build well if we do that then who's respond i guess the select board and their budget you know who's then setting money aside for the yeah. ultimate infrastructure improvements because the more housing that's incentivized you know our septic i mean our, our sanitary isn't going to hold up our school isn't going to hold up you know well that's another thing joe zagranich pointed out if you do a development it has to be on town sewer uh but i, I wish there were some way we could incentivize a friendly 40b uh, and, and rather than wait for something to happen, try to make something happen. Well, so I think that, might, it, that might be require a change in our zoning bylaw, but would, at least would be in front of the curve. No, it actually would not require. Uh, no, friendly okay. forty B would not require a change in the zoning bylaw because, yeah. by its nature, it allows the uh, the developer to override zoning. Okay if they are eligible. Even a friendly one, they can override zoning? Yeah. Yeah. Really? So the friendly that. one, we're, we're just, and, and I know that Joe and Jim had experience with a friendly one that didn't prove to be anything but, um, <laughs> but I, 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 uh, I think we have all learned from their experience. So for example, you could negotiate 
that yes, we will we will welcome a friendly 40B if 100% of the units are permanently affordable. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I don't think when this all started 20 and 30 and more years ago, affordable for 30 years seemed like a, seemed like a long time. But if we could make it permanently affordable and it would not drop off the rolls and it every unit was a permanently affordable, not 25%, um, if someone were willing to agree to that, uh, yeah, I think we could play let's make a deal. You know, one of the amazing things about zoning and the uh, repercussions that are 10, 12, 15 years down the line is uh, Hatfield, for example. When Hatfield went from 125 foot frontage to 200 foot frontage, the lots became more expensive in Hatfield. Therefore, none of the developers were building uh, lots in Hatfield. Fast forward about 10, nine years ago, Hatfield, or maybe eight years ago, Hatfield only graduated 18 kids. Yeah, you can't run a railroad with only 18 kids. Uh, certainly not a school system. So uh, yeah, it's that delicate balance. We don't wanna have too many kids where you have to build another school. Uh, yet you wanna at make it as affordable for the middle class people too, to come in the town. So I, well, we're, we're graduating what less than 30 students a year in a school. I've, I've been in the school, the uh, um, that the what they call the senior hallway is the hallway you walk down to go to the basketball games. Yep. And you notice there's a cable lock on half of the lockers in that hall. Yes. Uh, I think the school can, and this is actually a conversation we should probably try to bring in the uh, uh, representative of the school committee or the school administration. Um, bring in but, Dr. Annie there. But definitely the school accommodated a larger population. I want to say not that long ago, but it was 50 years ago. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, well, the elementary school that was constructed was constructed to hold 400 students. There's not that many students in the whole system, K through 12. Jim, why don't you share with how many kids were in your class with Mark and Mike uh, when, when you were in the eighth grade? Just for information, Bill and I graduated in the same class. It was the largest class to ever go through Hopkins. Mr. Sarzinski graduated with my sister. It was the second largest class to ever go through Hopkins. Our class had 88 graduating students. I think Mike's had 69 or something, Mike? I think it was more than that, but hell, I don't remember. Yeah, you were somewhere around 69 or 70 okay. students. And my daughter's class, which graduated, I want to say, Let's see. I think 2001 was the third widest graduating class to go through school. They had like 60 uh -huh. kids in our class, 61. And since then, it's it, and in the, the graduating class after us dropped, dropped from 88 to, I think, 40, Bill, if I'm right. So high, I think grade, high 30s, low uh, 40 last, last year. So it was a huge drop off between them. So how many more cows do we have in town than graduating? No, 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 sorry. <laughs> oh, it used, it used to be there. Why don't you make, you can make that count, Mark. Uh, it used to be 20 dairy farms way back when, uh, and that I can remember. Now there are four, mm. maybe five. I was going to say, Barstow's Cook, West, Kakoski, I think there's more than that. So getting back to affordable Not housing. Me. Getting back on, on track. <laughs> okay. uh, I had an old girlfriend from Slovenia who was part of Yugoslavia and they had one bureaucrat 
per cow. <laughs> you were talking about, I'll just throw in one more tidbit. You were talking about how things have changed in 50 years. 50 yeah. years ago, Charlton Heston made a movie about what he thought was going to happen in 50 years, and that was called Soylent Green. They, and it says, in the future, in the year 2022, people will be eating Soylent Green. Soylent Green is people <laughs> breeding us like cattle to feed ourselves. Anyway, I digress. I digress. So, so, so we've, been, we've been bouncing this friendly 40B thing around. And you know, is it does it have any legs to it? I mean, or is it just well, something to talk about? I think that that definitely is the conversation, and you know, it, it's understood that having and I think I mentioned that's the last meeting I was meeting with. Um, I have a meeting with the town administrator and um, someone on your affordable affordable housing committee um, to to discuss. Um, a possible affordable um, a housing production plan. We, we had this conversation maybe a couple of meetings ago, but th those are the types of recommendations that would come out of it, um, as well as, you know, presentation of those types of resources to get you there. Um, well, you know, you can make all the recommendations you want, but you got to find somebody that's willing to do it. Right. You know, we got enough recommendations. We got to find somebody that would be willing to put a developer to be willing to do it. I mean, you, so I, I don't, I these, don't meetings go, these meetings go on for 10 more years. I don't think it is unreasonable to maybe be looking for someone. If you look at Amherst, it's virtually built out. Yeah. Um, what we do have are, and this is something we've been talking about in the economic development working group. Um, you know, the next, the next big thing is going to be a, an adaptive reuse of, a, of an existing site. Um, and um, where that will be, I don't know, but there, yeah, there's not a lot of unbroken ground in uh, on sewer for a large apartment complex, but there are underutilized parcels and you know, malls have a life cycle. Exactly, Bill. I was thinking that way, and believe it or not, there was uh, something like that proposed uh, by the a planning committee or a uh, a course at UMass. I saw it at the Hoyuk Mall, and part of Hampshire Mall was divided into apartments. So some student had a little bit. Uh, maybe more foresight than we do. I don't know. <laughs> well, look at what I mean. Right now, they're looking a few years ago, and it wasn't that long ago, five, six years ago, everybody was putting up motels in Hadley, hotels. Yeah. Now, two of them were looking to be torn down and something completely different put in their place. So, well, Ken, right, you know, that a word, a word to Ken. Ken. Do not be afraid to rein us in and try to keep this going because uh, <laughs> well, it, it, obviously it, it, we'll give you the big <laughs> stick and you can tell us that <laughs> because as you can see, we digress when once we accomplished a lot tonight and thank you for coming up with those, those yeah. numbers. Uh, yeah, I'm going to go back to Howard Johnson's and get some affordable office units. No, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> that'd be a great place for affordable housing. So, thank you, Ken. Of course. I mean, I think yeah, thanks, about, I think we need to think and just digest what they get for us without having them do any more legwork on this. I think we've got about as much legwork as we can handle. We just got to decide how we're going to put it together and go forward. Yeah, I mean, we're being very noble, but uh, certainly. You know, part of my speech is the fact that all the communities around us, almost including Amherst, just Amherst just barely makes the 10 percent and, and Northampton just barely makes the 10 percent. Uh, Sunderland only had one percent, but that's why they've got that uh, apartment complex going in. But they have problems with where's the sewer going to go? Is it going to be a big septic system? They still haven't ironed that out. So and. South Hadley only has 4%. Hatfield has, no, South Hadley has 6%. Hatfield has 4%. So we don't want to become 
uh, go beyond while the other communities are not doing their responsibility. So those, that's my editorial comment for today. Uh, well, so I, I want to say for the record, first of all, we d have not reopened the public hearing on oh. planning board regulations. I can, it's continued to tonight. I would like to make a motion to continue the public hearing, which we have not reopened, continue it without reopening to uh, maybe the second November meeting. Okay. That would be November 16th. I don't think we have anything on for the 16th. Not yet, that's correct. Okay, so I'll make that motion to continue. Second. Uh, motion a second. Any other discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Okay, so Ken, I wonder if we could just ask you to keep on trying to get in touch with Shrewsbury. Yeah. And anyone else you can find and get any sense of what their um, payment in lieu payments look like. Um, I know I, I did send one around really early in the process. It was, it was a North Shore town, and I forget which it was. And they were doing uh, beachfront condos, and they had Gloucester. wasn't it Gloucester? Something like that. Yeah, uh, they Rockport, had Rockport or Gloucester, I think. Gloucester. Yeah, something up there. They had worked it out that for there would be a flat assessment for every condo that was sold. And the ones that had beachfront, that, that had ocean views were like, call that 25,000. And the ones that did not have ocean views were 15,000 per unit, mm. which sounded okay, because again, a unit's a unit. And that was in, in place of requiring that any of those be affordable. I'll try to look through my, my file and see if I can find that one again. Well, we, we took that, online class the zoom meeting and that's where it came up remember yes that was the the planning director from that town was talking about their experience and then i yeah, dug exactly. up the actual bylaw and found it um so that that kind of goes back to more of mike's idea about making getting a, a slice of every developed lot yep. but what i'd really be interested in is any if you could find anyone to talk to who could tell you what what they're actually getting. You know, getting back to a slice of every development, develop lot, I would prefer, so we don't penalize the, the middle income person, is getting a slice of every lot and develop and house that it has developed over a half a million dollars. You know, uh, that would protect the middle class, middle uh -huh. income people in town. You sounded like a political, somebody running for political. Well, I, you know, I'm like, only tax the rich. We'll no, only no. tax the rich. <laughs> I'm, I'm, okay. changing, I'm changing my ways. <laughs> so, I, um, and then I, I guess we certainly can, can talk about taking a broader view of inclusionary zoning and friendly 40 B's at the 16th. So I think we'll try to yeah. just keep well, trying to protect that. So nothing else gets know, scheduled for it. I, you know, I would, I, we can talk about 40 B's some more, but I want some other people in town if possible asking questions rather than just have this an intellectual discussion. And the only way to get a friendly 40 be going is to talk about it and approach somebody to see if they'd be willing to doing it then they can be part of the discussion no yep. because you know hell i'm not a developer no nope. but we have to we have to prepare the ground that yeah is, we are worth we'll, we'll, discussing well, we'll, well, well perhaps a developer could help us prepare the ground a little bit because you know i'm i'm shooting buckshot mark you just <laughs> have to you just have to plow in mark you just have to plow in um I have something I would like to ask to add to um, Ken's charge, but that's not my not my um, role. So I will pose this to to Jim as as a chairman. 
Would we, uh, you know, I'd be interested in while Ken's looking at these other communities and what what their payments in blue of, and I'd be interested in what they've spent and how they've spent it. What kind of transactions, you know, because you know, it's hard for us to picture, you know, we're building up this fund, but where, how have people successfully expended that, yeah. those funds? I think that's a good idea. Yeah. Towns that have an affordable housing trust, um, some that have spent it, and what have they spent it on? It'd be good to um, learn from their experience, well, yeah. Gloucester yeah. was a three, three or four story, basically apartment building. I mean, there's quite a few towns around it that yeah, have, order, that have to make funds, housing affordable. But nobody has spent much, if anything. In, in order to make housing affordable, Hadley is going to have to go the direction of more concentrated housing. Uh, it's just, it's not going to happen. It was single dwellings. It's just not. No. We could have our own UMass Southwest, you know, with our towers. Yeah, we're definitely, we, we know we're, we're not going to get bang for our buck by churning out one Habitat for Humanity house every other year. No. <laughs> That's not going to do it. We want a big bang. We want, we want to make us, you, you, you guys that have been here 30 years want to make, 40 years want to make a statement. <laughs> so, uh, as to Mark's point, right. yeah. uh, right. as to Mark's point, Ken, I think I recall one of the trainings we went to on the various affordable housing. It was maybe Lennox or Lee that um, used the affordable housing, their affordable housing trust fund, to steer a um, a forty B to a location that they would prefer to have it at. And they used some of their money to uh, maybe build an access road or extend the sewer line to that spot, as opposed to the spot where the developer initially wanted to go. Okay. So- um, So the town that, paid for that or- So yeah, I guess the, the town agreed that they would extend the sewer line to to the uh, the parcel on the east side of town that they wanted to see built up, but they weren't going to extend it to the parcel on the west side of the town that they didn't want to see built up. So it was something like that. Uh, I wish I had more detail, but that was something I used subsequently in discussion discussing why an affordable housing trust fund can leverage itself. But there's something something like that. I wish I had I wish I had better memory, but about 30, maybe 35 years ago in the when I was in the private sector, I was doing a project for EOCD, which uh, that's what they were called then the Executive Office of Community Development. And I was doing a big housing project, and I think it was in Lee. I you know, I can't remember if it was 40 or 80 units and all this. And, you know, it never got off the boards you know, whether the economy or whatever, I was just a, you know, junior architect at that point. Lee so. is a little poor community as opposed to Linux being more affluent, so. Mm -hmm. um, so I quickly looked at, because I, I, I referred to this, I think a, a couple of meetings ago um, with regards to Shrewsbury in the absence of being able to contact them, which I will continue to try. Um, but in their housing production plan, they do, list the payment in lieu of units. And since 2005, they've accrued um, $933,901. Um, it'll be interesting to see how they spent that. Um, what town was that, Ken? Shrewsbury. Shrewsbury. Shrewsbury, okay. So that's in their housing production plan. Um, but I think, you know, Mark's points about how and um, what types of transactions have come from, you know, the monies in the housing trust fund could be, you know, it could provide some context for the possibilities in Hadley um, as you build that trust fund. So that's just for, you know, just for information okay. for you all. So Mr. Grimaldi has very patiently waded through all of this and he did send us the revised plan. So you have it. Let me let me bring them up. 
I am still here. Can you hear me? Yes. 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 You bored to death yet? Um, <laughs> I, I will tell you this. I did start moving, so um, <laughs> I, I, I probably can't look at the drawings right now. But I will say that um, I was correct and incorrect. Um, so the three-inch piece, when you're looking at the profile of the uh, sides, the three-inch piece, the entire three-inch piece slides out. So we have the one-inch gap. You got the, the one inch, yes. You've got one inch standoffs. That sounds about right. And um, and that that's really the uh, the difference with between the two sets of drawings. Yep. Okay. So, so. I'm going to page through this. We're on page. Oh, two. and actually, um, there is another difference, and I quite frankly don't know why, but they made the sign facing. Uh, maple smaller. Hmm. So instead of it being uh, 32 square feet, it's 25 square. Uh, and I'm, I apologize if you could look at it. I think it's 25.4 square feet. Maybe, yeah. they're, maybe they're making larger medallions. I don't know. Well, no, I they, think they it, have great, they have great, such great product that they're, uh, they don't even need a big sign. Right. <laughs> Word of mouth is all they need. That's right. And, 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 and you know, not to be coy about it, you know, once they know, as with anything, once you know where it is, you go. Or if you like it, you go. You don't yeah. need to know where the sign is. So. Exactly. Um, right. But the, so the South Maple is 25 and change, and the medallions are still the same, 7.07. So um, we are now down from the 47 to, I guess, 39 and change. Yeah. Almost 40, but close enough. Yes. Yeah. So, so, so if they wanted to do the Popeyes larger, they could. Well, and I, you know what? The only thing I'm thinking in my mind is of why did they do this is if they eventually do want to come back and ask for the pylon sign. Well, they got to, you know, they can say, hey guys, you know, we're 24 feet short. Um, we're 24 feet short on the building. So, you know, we don't have, we don't have views. So, you know, try to get something. I, again, they, I, I quite honestly will tell you, they did not have that conversation with me. I'm just, I was sitting in the car saying, why didn't we go smaller? <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Just, I'm going to just page yeah. through the package. And that's the only thing I can think of. Okay. I'm going to page yes. through the package. We're on page two. We're now on page three with the three foot medallion. medallion and that is also a standoff. Halo lit. Yep. Clearly marked halo lit. Yep. Uh, page four, the front facade. Page yes. five, the um, right. the left and right left and right elevations. Uh, page six is the drive through uh, canopy. Canopy. Page seven are the window canopies. Yep. And page eight is also a window. And page nine are the shutters. Correct. I think we have a winner. Yes. <laughs> So there's no there's no rear elevation or did I just miss that? Uh, there's really the rear elevation is there's a there's a dumpster. there's the exist well there's the existing exterior cooler box okay. which we are going to replace it with a new exterior cooler box but as far as signage or decor there's really nothing. Yeah, this is just the signage package. Yes. Uh, Can you forward this to me, Bill? Pardon? Can you forward it to me so I can yes. include it with an email to the building inspector? In fact, I'll forward it to everybody. Okay. And Jose Altuve just popped out on the first pitch. Not that anyone cares. Well, yeah. <laughs> Had anybody but, heard of the Red Sox first baseman before, say, a week and a half ago? <laughs> Was that 
uh, this is for Mark Dunn. Uh, Bobby or Kyle? When uh, we were at a planning board meeting when the earthquake happened in uh, San Francisco or Oakland. Remember that, Jim? Yep. Yeah. My sister was living in San Francisco, is living in San Francisco then, is, is still there now. Yeah. <laughs> That's when it was at Candlestick. Yeah, all right. And uh, so am I complete? So I just want to, uh, yeah, I'm going to make a uh, motion. Motion uh, on 21. So uh, I'm going to make a motion to approve the sign package uh, dated uh, 10. 1321, uh, Mark Halo. That's the motion. Second. Your motion. You're making motion. a motion to accept it? Yes, motion to approve the sign package. Motion and a second. Yeah, motion and a second. Any other discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. I will get an email out to that tonight and to. Uh, thank you, Robert. Everybody involved. I thank you. And uh, by the way, uh, you know, unfortunately, I, I suffer from the same problem as you guys. I, I'm kind of interested in this stuff. Um, I think you really, you guys, somebody brought it up. You guys really got to go talk to the guy that's taking down the Hojos because. He's looking for a tenant that he's not going to find. I mean, well, going by the market down here, he's not going to find that tenant to be to build that three-story unit. So get a mixed use in, have a little control over it. He already has an issue with the uh, water table there. So maybe you could justify um, some type of quasi half in-ground parking garage that's at the subterranean level. And do a mixed use that he has some offices and then what did you need 24 units i mean i don't know if you're going to get all 24 but if you put something to that guy you know you might have a little control over him or little, at least a little leverage well thank you for your thoughts thanks for your input would you be willing to come to hadley and work with us on a friendly 40 big number one <laughs> you know what i i will tell you this there's a town that I, I was on the planning board in my town and just, I, I took a little break just because I knew I had a couple of projects coming in front of the town. So I didn't want to be that guy that always steps down all the time. Um, but there's a town uh, down here in Jersey, everything that has a train connected to New York city has just lost its mind because everybody ran out of New York city. And um, <laughs> what, one of my buddies who's a civil engineer and he's the township engineer a couple towns over and look the laws are a little different and they're probably nicer up where you get where you guys are because you know this is jersey i, I understand the armpit that I, I live in um and uh but still he was able to get basically like set aside a couple of areas and one was a warehouse that they took as an urban redevelopment. But so the town took it in a fashion that it wasn't an eminent domain, but under the regulations, and again, I don't know how they translate to Massachusetts, but under the regulations, they were able to declare it a area of required um, reclassification and, and rezo um, remodel. Uh, that's not the right word. And I just, for a lack of thinking of the right word uh redevelopment sorry redevelopment and they were able to at that point put notice out that and it, it was going out for uh redevelopment they were going to actually take control of the property so that they could then control who they who it gets sold to and again i don't know now, this is where uh, 
the Esquire at the end of my name would help, but I only have an RA. Um, and then they were able to work it that way. And I'm telling you, they, it's crazy. With the traffic you'll see, um, it's crazy about how many units that got built, but they at least were able to control the outcome. They wanted a few things. Certain places are like, okay, well, you need to do a mixed use because we need some commercial here. Oh, you need to, you're next to the library. You need to do this. You know, they, they, they were able to get something out of it. So right. it's, Thank you. it's a difficult thing to, to go with. Well, I think we're going to try to be proactive. Mm -hmm. Robert, if, if, you're starting to break up. Uh, yeah, well, I'm on the turnpike, so, well, Good luck to your Red Sox. Rob, Robert, at, at, Robert, at the town meeting Saturday, I was appointed the official town taster. So I think if we start off with two ba uh, buckets of regular and two buckets of spicy, that'll be a start, okay? You got <laughs> it, absolutely. Good luck, guys, and uh, good luck to your Red Sox. I'm a, I'm a disappointed Mets fan, so okay. have, a good, uh, have a good season. We're already down one nothing, but okay, thanks. Take care. Thank you. Okay. Bye -bye. Um, Who's pitching for the Red Sox tonight? Pavetta. I don't know. Nick Pavetta. So our next week, right now, you you were scheduled for the first Tuesday of November, but I don't think we're going to have much. Um, but so we will be we, the second Tuesday, right? Or the, the the second Tuesday would be the sixteenth for the regulation. We want to be involved in that one. Yeah. Okay. So we have. Uh, ideal coming in for November 2nd. November 2nd. Um, this will be continued to November 16th. Right. And then Kevin will be in December 7th. 7th. Our article that passed on Saturday, is that uh, effective immediately or is there that was, theoretically or technically that was effective the first date of publication in a newspaper okay so that was effective a month ago oh even before it passed if it no no if it passed at town meeting it's okay. considered effective the date of first publication in a oh. newspaper oh that's interesting okay unless it's a subdivision and that's another set of rules okay so yeah, they if that if that's true, then they don't need their zoning variance anymore. Well, no, they still need a variance because they have that port cashier that's coming at the canopy okay. is coming off the oh, side. Oh, right, right, yes, they need that. Yeah, for that, but they don't need it for the TDR. Yeah, right. Okay. Anybody have anything else? Just one point about one to five lots and over five lots. Is there a concern if we vary the amount that people have to pay by lots that is there a due process problem bill or whatever you want to call it that we're, we're, we're segregating people and not uh, treating them equally? Yeah, you probably do want to be careful about doing graduated rates. Um, yeah. But um but maybe you could just address that by, yeah, if you're going to do an approval not required subdivision, no uh, okay. no charge. and uh -huh. But if you're going to do a, um, a formal subdivision, then uh, okay. yeah, it probably should be something. Um, you just have to figure out how to word it. Okay. So to throw that out. But, yeah, I think you're, it's a good point. I think we probably don't want to burden unless you were doing a declining balance, like 20,000 per lot for the first five and 15,000 a lot for the next five. Yeah. But if you started an increasing balance, that would be a problem, I think. Okay. Okay. So no, I don't think I have anything else either. Okay. Motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Meeting is history. Thank you and thank you, John.